Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I am Peggy Edersheim Kalb, President of the Board of Trustees, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to Authors Live, made possible through the support of the Greenwich Library Board and charitable contributions from our community. Before we begin, please silence your cell phones and refrain from using them, even taking photos during the event is prohibited. Books will be available for sale and signing after the program, thanks to our friends at Diane's Books. I am especially delighted to welcome my friend Jennifer Egan on International Women's Day, a day celebrating the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. Jennifer Egan is the author of several novels and a short story collection. Her 2017 novel, Manhattan Beach, a New York Times bestseller, was awarded the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction and was voted New York City's One Book, One New York Read. Her previous novel, A Visit from the Goon Squad, won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and was named one of the best books of the decade by Time Magazine and Entertainment Weekly. She has written frequently for the New York Times Magazine and recently completed a term as president of PEN America. The New York Times named Ms. Egan's latest novel, Candy House, one of the 10 best books of 2022. Our moderator this evening is Barbara Hofert, who are happy to welcome back to Greenwich Library. Barbara is the editor of Library Journal's Pre-Pub Alert, a first buy guide to what's new in publishing. She is also past president, awards chair, and treasurer of the National Book Critics Circle, which just awarded her its inaugural service award. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Egan and Barbara Hoffert. Okay. 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 Okay, thank you for the introduction and welcome everyone to a conversation with Jennifer Egan about The Candy House, which was multiply best booked last year when it was published and is appearing just this week in paperback. Here is a quick refresher or an introduction to the book in case you are behind in your reading. Um, in 2010, tech genius Bick uh, Bix Bowden is standing on a New York City bridge, unable to retrieve his last memory of a young man who drowned there when he conceives his next great idea. Inspired by a Let's Talk meeting he just attended, uh, where a Columbia professor mentioned experimenting with downloading or externalizing memory. Flash forward a few years. Uh, and Own Your Unconscious, developed by Bix's company Mandala, um, allows users to access all of their own memories and share them with others in a grand collective consciousness. Not everyone loves it. The narrative spills forward, moving from scream for authenticity's sake, Alfred, whose father was at that Let's Talk meeting, to Alfred's Heading for a fall prig of a brother, Miles, their kleptomaniac turned artist cousin, Sasha, and her doctor husband, Drew, their son, quantification obsessed, Lincoln, anthropologist, Miranda Klein, who decries social media's use of her algorithms for pre predictive purposes, her ex-husband, music producer, Lou Klein, Chris Salazar, associated with the collective consciousness, consciousness resistant movement called Mondrian, uh, his young family friend, Lulu, later to become a citizen agent in a dashingly conceived second person section, and a host of others with each story elegantly daisy chained to the next to create a remarkable whole. So that leaves us with the questions. Why do we need technology to confirm our identity? How can we be authentically ourselves in a world of multiplying images and social media invasiveness? And what are the true risks of technology absorbing us today? And finally, how did Jennifer Egan manage to create such a wonderfully entertaining book out of all of this heady material? Okay, this is what we're here to find out. Okay, so we're gonna start. So Bix uh, Bowden was trying to retrieve a lost memory when he was inspired to conceive Own Your Unconscious. What inspired you to conceive Own Your Unconscious and the characters and events surrounding it? Well, the answer is that I didn't actually conceive of Own Your Unconscious until kind of late in the process, mm -hmm. believe it or not. So I wrote this book over a, a period of a few years. I started one chapter while I was on my book tour for A Visit from the Goon Squad. So in a way, I never stopped thinking about these characters. The chapter about Bix I wrote in 2012 
And I knew that he was going to have some kind of revelation on that bridge, but I had no idea what it would be. And then I put that chapter aside and worked on other chapters, many of which didn't end up working. There's a very high failure ratio with this kind of material because, you know, I'm taking all these chances and you can't both take chances and expect everything to work out, even though, of course, I always do. Um, so it was only later as a result of other pieces of writing that came along related to the Bix chapter that I began to glean that we were in a future or and even a present, a kind of alternate version of the present where it's possible for people to somehow view each other's memories. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really know how that was possible. Mm -hmm. I think the first inkling of it came to me when there's a guy named Lincoln, you mentioned him in passing, um, mm -hmm. who is a kind of a, he's basically a data expert. Um, and he is trying, he's in love with his colleague, whom he calls M. He wants to make her fall in love with him. And he's trying to figure out kind of quantitative ways to make this happen, um, which is hard. Uh, and he, come, he, he briefly considers that he could view her memories in the collective and see what her tastes are, but that would be a violation and he would never do it. So I think, I think in the writing of that, I realized for the first time, oh, okay, that's interesting. So he can do that. We're in the 2030s, so somehow we're in a future where that's possible. How is it possible? Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I'm really pointing out is that my initial writing process of fiction is so intuitive and without a plan and very improvisational. And much like other kinds of improvisation, I then take the, the most interesting elements of that and try to understand what larger world they're part of. Mm -hmm. And so those little glimmers of, you know, shared consciousness came along in that kind of intuitive way. And then I, I still, I had Bix on the bridge <laughs> waiting for an inspiration and little by little, these different elements began to float together and mm -hmm. cohere. So it's not an orderly procession. It's lumped together and you put it together. It, it is so disorderly. I, 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 to say that it's not orderly is not going far enough. It is, it is chaotic. It is messy. It is, and in fact, I, 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 I recognize that when a book is published, it has a kind of seamless look to it. You know, it looks like, no, that could never have really been a big mess. And I so want people to understand, especially younger writers, how the fact that it's a mess does not in any way mean that it won't ultimately, you know, look like that, um, that on my website, I've really tried to lay bare this process. So if you go to the homepage and you hover over it, every chapter is represented there and as published, the first page of it. And if you click on the first paragraph, that dissipates and you're looking at a marked up draft. And if you hover there, that dissipates and mm -hmm. you're looking at the handwritten first draft of that paragraph, mm -hmm. which is always dated. And it's fun, it's some in some cases include really funny notes. I always say how many pages I wrote that day. And there's one where I wrote five pages and then it says, yay, <laughs> <laughs> with an exclamation point. So that's how it starts. Very handmade and intuitive. And there are lots of reasons that I do it that way, but they boil down to that's how I get my best work. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about writing as an act of discovery for you. 100%. Because mm -hmm. if I sit here in this chair and try to think of a good story, it won't be interesting. It won't be good enough. It will, I think that I've come to, I started thinking about chat GBT as I'm sure we all are, even though I've never used it. Um, and I think, you know, chat GPT is drawing on a kind of, it is literally drawing on groupthink, group utterance. Mm -hmm. It's drawing on all of our utterances that are online. Mm -hmm. And so what it comes up with is pretty stock because it's, it's partaking of groupthink. I think if I sit in a chair and try to think of a story, I am also partaking of groupthink too much. So I need to get out ahead of that and come up with things that I can't think of so that hopefully there'll be things other people couldn't have thought of. And you succeed. 
<laughs> uh, talking about interesting stories, I mean, one of the things I love about this book is its structure, which moves, as I said, character by character. And each of them uh, has an interesting story of his or her own. And each of them, in fact, is kind of the main character of their particular section. So any one of them could have been a starting point for a story. Uh, and in fact, I wouldn't be surprised to see them spun off in other in other points in sometime in the future. So I'm I'm holding on for that. Okay, mm -hmm. but uh, but just and I, of course I was going to ask you why proceed why not find you know you could put it you could get all the stories together and finally do a hierarchy of them, so to speak, you could have unfolded it ultimately from Bix's point of view, but you didn't. You chose to highlight character by character, linked in, as I said, that daisy chain fashion, and each one had a, a you know, passing on something to the other. So what do you like about that as a writing style? Well, it doesn't work for every kind of story at all, but I think for, a, for an ensemble story that I want to work kind of kaleidoscopically, this mm -hmm. is the best approach. And in a way, this too, I stumbled on because when I was um, writing A Visit from the Goon Squad, well, actually before I was writing A Visit from the Goon Squad, I was avoiding writing this historical novel that I published after called Manhattan Beach, which I sensed was going to be an enormous amount of work. And I was correct. So as I was avoiding that, I was writing a few short stories and they were as, as customary with short stories about different people and written in different ways technically because they weren't part of one book, so I thought. But then I realized that they were going to be part of one book and that they that they would connect. And I felt that the funnest thing about that project was the very fact that they didn't feel like they were part of the same book. So it felt like that it just seemed that there was the possibility of additional power because if each piece stands on its own, suggests a whole world mm -hmm. and a constellation of history and experience and perception, which is what each of us has in our lives, um, and is written in its own distinctive way, and yet they all combine into one story, that's doing a lot of things at once, which mm -hmm. I think of as the basic project of fiction. It's compression. Mm -hmm. You're trying to suggest the totality and the complexity of human life and human perception in a relatively small space. So I was enamored of, of this, but it had happened by accident. So I kept doing it and ended up with a visit from the Goon Squad. And although I knew I didn't want the Candy House to be um, anything like a similar book, I did find that hewing to those three kind of approaches each chapter stand on, stand on its own is about a different person and has a different technical approach. It seemed like that was sort of fun and, and could work again. Mm -hmm. All those different characters, uh, the tech legend, the tech disciple, the resistor, the loser who had all the advantages, those are all recognizable uh, people, but none of your characters are mere studies or carriers of ideas. They're, they stand on their own. Uh, they're not types. Um, and you've placed them in a technologically tweaked world that isn't exactly like our own. How then did you keep them real? Because they are. You know, that's an interesting, I find it, I'm most um, at a loss to describe how characters come along in my fiction because I don't use people I know to the great joy and relief <laughs> of many. Um, I, I'm worst at myself, so I it's never me, I'll tell you that. Um, I, I guess all I can say is that I, I, I start with a time and a place. Let me say that first. So my entry point is usually a, a sense of atmosphere, a sense of where and not really who. And of course, if you, and so I begin my improvisation, if you will, there. So that the question then is, who is perceiving this environment? And that is the first inkling I have of character. And then who else is there? Well, now we've got more people. And then what do they say and do? And that's the beginning of a plot. So what I'm looking for are things that feel real, and then I kind of push into those. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm, I am 
I don't, if, if something isn't doing that, then I kind of move away from it. I'm sort of following the, the, the little elements of a person, the things you might hear or see that feel alive. Mm -hmm. And then I'm continuing in that direction. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm doing a kind of triage myself mm -hmm. in looking for that and, and sort of leaning into it. And, 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 but sometimes people, I go, I go wrong with characters for sure. Um, like there's a character in um, Manhattan Beach who, you know, there was a long section I, I, where I just, he became intolerable. And I thought, oh my <laughs> God, I can't bear this guy. But I was so crazy about him. What went wrong? And then I realized he started brooding a lot. Like he's not doing anything. He's just worrying and, you know, kind of grumbling. And I realized that the reason that was so unappealing is that that is the one thing this guy never does. So in recognizing that I couldn't tolerate him in this brooding state, I made a discovery about his character, which is that he responds to what might make a different kind of person brood with action, always action, even the wrong action. And that was actually, that gave me a big insight into him. So sometimes going wrong and recognizing that it's wrong is actually very useful ultimately mm -hmm. because it's showing me something about that person. Mm -hmm. Again, writing is an act of discovery. Totally. totally. And, and, and trial and error. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I said that this world that you um, have created is not altogether like ours, but it's enough like ours to, have, to create some discomfort, because I think we all think now about what is technology doing to us. You can't open up the paper, which, of course, you wouldn't do anymore, because that was a really old-fashioned thing to say. You don't open up the paper anymore. You open up your screen and you look at it. Okay, you can't without reading a story about how we, uh, how what is technology doing to us. Um, and it's, I love the phrase that you had somewhere of the danger of people handing over their minds and it's to a threateningly omniscient collective. So how close are we really? And how much does that worry you? Well, I, I have a kind of divided approach to technology as a, as a human, as a civilian, I really don't like it. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm afraid of it and not just in big ways, but in small ways, like I do it wrong. You know, I'm that person who accidentally CCs the entire list. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm the person whose, whose Twitter account was hacked and I sent vitamin ads out for a while without <laughs> even knowing it. You know, I'm just bad at it. Um, and I'm also not drawn to it. Like the idea of a shiny new machine, I don't think, oh, great, a shiny new machine. I think, oh my God, I have to figure out how to work, work it. it. It's going to take forever. I'm going to do it wrong. Um, and then on a, so that that's just a practical level. I, I'm not enamored of technology. And then on a broader level, I'm absolutely terrified of it. I mean, I, you know, I, I react with, with fear to every new development. All of that said, as a fiction writer, I am totally fascinated mm -hmm. and enjoy it unbelievably. Mm -hmm because it's it's ever changing and because and precisely because it affects us in such deep mm -hmm. ways. So and you know I feel like tech, the the evolution of telecommunications technology is really the big story I've witnessed in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, born in 62, got to college with only the uh, only call waiting having become common. <laughs> then the answering machine, oh my god, that was like a, a revolution. Um, and then, you know, we all know what's come since. So it feels like a constant, you know, um, an accelerating rate of change. And it does affect the way we live. And so I'm fascinated by it. And it also offers me forms that I am all too happy to bend to my purposes. And I do feel like, um, you know, it's one for the good guys. If I can take a digital form and you know, make it work in an old fashioned genre like fiction. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pleasure. Which you do. There, There's some very interesting, for those of you who haven't read it, there's some very interesting, different kind of formatting going on that that um, you get to it. And it's a surprise and a pleasure because they're entering a whole other, it's a whole other book in a way. So that was fun. But so that was it's interesting to me because one of the things I noticed, you know, Mandela is pitted against Mondrian the whole time through the book. And I think a lot of us feel that we're siding with Mondrian. But 
you have one character who points out that, you know, uh, mandala had, crimes have been solved because of it. Child pornography and dementia have, have been radically reduced. Empathy has increased worldwide. Mondrian may represent freedom, but mandala represents collaboration. So you're not being didactic at all. And I thought that was an important point, uh, saying that nothing is all good or all bad, but mixing, uh, showing the mixed effect. And I'm wondering if that was something you were conscious of doing when you were writing. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I just know that as a reader, I really do not like didactic fiction. And I'm also a journalist, so I have other areas to, if I want to, you know, explain things or, you know, suggest opinions, I have another realm where I can do that. For me, fiction is much more of a place to ask questions than to answer them. And I find that even when I walk in with a sense of, what I think the book is about. Like, for example, with my novel, Look at Me, I was explicitly thinking, and this was published in 2001, so, you know, an eon ago, technologically, I was wondering whether image culture, the, the, the um, imperative to present ourselves as products, basically, as images, had changed who we were to ourselves. And the very fact that I would ask that question kind of suggests that I thought the answer was yes. Mm -hmm. But in the course of writing the book, I realized that I thought the answer was no, that, that that's, that's what the book says. <laughs> um, I mean, not explicitly, but the story it tells does not give us that lesson. Mm -hmm. So with The Candy House, um, it's true that there's a kind of, um, there's an opposition that develops. And for those of you who haven't read it, just to explain, Mandala is the company that makes the machine that allows people to externalize their memories for their own review. And if they want, purely optional, to share them to a collective as the price of access to that collective themselves. And then a kind of um, opposition arises to this the equivalent um, of what we would call now like off the grid, mm -hmm, sort of someone exactly. who has a flip phone and isn't online. But, you know, because the the reality that that people are trying to escape in this world is so much more extreme, the escape is much more extreme. And the only way that they can escape being represented in the collective, because even if they don't participate, every memory anyone has of interactions with them <laughs> is in the collective. So there's no way to escape it. The way they do it is that they they cast off their identities altogether and disappear, and they're called eluders. And there's a not-for-profit that helps these eluders to, to disappear by impersonating them online. Because if you just vanish, everyone knows you're gone. But if you vanish with that, and only um, vanish physically, but remain fully active online, most people won't know you've disappeared. And so Mondrian is the company that helps people do this. And it's, you know, this is, I mean, this is all, you know, a little silly. Um, and it's, it, at one point we learned that the best um, proxies, which is what someone impersonating an eluder online is called, the best proxies are fiction writers because <laughs> we know how to impersonate people. <laughs> Right. No, that and that's and it's realistic because certainly we know that there are people who have people writing for them online and there are fake accounts. And so it's it's not altogether um, in the realm of the uh, impossible. And and uh, you've discovered and commented on something that we're already doing. True. And in fact, it, it, it isn't even just in the digital world. I mean, I was a private secretary for three years when I was, um, you know, trying to make it as a writer. And I impersonated my boss all the time. Mm -hmm. I carried on whole correspondences in her name. Mm -hmm. And she would say, oh, I ran into so-and-so. And they mentioned, what's this? What did you say in the letter? <laughs> <laughs> and I signed books for her. She was a writer. Writer. I had I knew how to copy her handwriting. So I was a proxy, you know, in the 80s. <laughs> and it just and technology just allows us to expand that in such interesting and sometimes dangerous and sometimes good ways, depending. So that's part of the point. Right. Um, it's interesting because you're talking about uh, people feeling that their 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 selves are about their um, privacy is violated by joining the cultural consciousness or even having other people remember them. But it's interesting, you actually use the word privacy only once in the whole book. 
uh, and private is used a few times. Another word though that you use a lot um, is authenticity. Alfred bemoans its loss. Rebecca, whom we meet at Let's Talk, the Let's Talk meeting that was at the beginning, is studying how it is problematized by digital representation and it's being leached of meaning. So, first of all, what do you mean by authenticity? It sounds like, you know, 80s conversation at um, your post philosophy class, you know, right? Um, well, I'll start by saying the reason I think the, it's interesting that you noticed that about the word privacy. I think the reason the word privacy appears so seldom is that that's one of those words that immediately suggests a judgment because no one is going to say it's really good that no one has privacy. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about privacy, we're in an environment where we're being told something bad is happening. So I think that's why I avoided it. It's to your earlier point authenticity is is a concept that fascinates me i have no idea what authenticity is but we as a culture are pretty obsessed with it mm -hmm. um and i and that's usually a sign that it it feels like a scarce and precious <laughs> entity i read a book that had a huge impact on me called the image by daniel borston mm -hmm. um published in 1961 uh called the image it's an extraordinary book, although it reads as very dated now for, for many reasons. Um, one of them being that all of his examples, his cultural examples are from the 1950s. So even not in my memory. Um, I actually had this on a syllabus and, and ended up kind of removing it and just having the students read little parts. But the he's Daniel Borston in this book invented the concept uh, or coined the phrase famous for being famous. Mm -hmm. And one of the points that he makes, and it's almost uncanny how relevant his basic thinking is, even to our media age, which is so different, is that mediation feels phony because it is, mm -hmm. you know, when something is made for television, which is what he was talking about, let's say he talks about things like the press conference, the behind the scenes tour. You, these things are feel they're meant to feel authentic and fresh, but they're actually events created for television. So his point is that mediation feels artificial because it is, and that results in a craving for authenticity. And then the world of media tries to satisfy that craving. And they do it with ever greater feats of artificiality which results in ever greater cravings for authenticity and so on. If you think about this, you will find iterations of it everywhere. I was so delighted about a year ago on the subway when my son suddenly, his phone beeped and he pulled it out and took a picture of both of us very quickly. And I said, what are you doing? The, the lighting's not good here. Don't shoot from <laughs> below. Um, and he said, oh no, this is this amazing new app called Be Real. Um, which tells you oh, at a certain so moment that you have to photograph your surroundings, but you never know when it's going to be. And the point is to get away from the kind of artificiality mm -hmm. of people photographing themselves on Instagram or whatever with makeup and special angles. So, you know, the, the, the name of the app says it all. Be real. We're, <laughs> we're, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's delicious. Um, so that phenomenon of of feeling deprived of authenticity, of authentic experience, whatever that is, and seeking it in the world of images is is really mm -hmm. fascinating to me. And but but actually, the way I approach it most directly in the book, as you say, is actually with someone who takes that that frustration <laughs> to a, a ludicrous extent. This guy named Alfred, who decides that he cannot bear artificiality, he is sickened by what he sees as the kind of um, phony behavior of everyone around him. And so he comes up with a way of, um, of basically demanding and prompting authentic responses in the people around him at his own will by screaming at the top of his lungs spontaneously in public. And of course, he gets a, a terrified and horrified reaction from everyone around him, and he absolutely eats this up. And it's almost, it's a bit of an addiction for him. Mm -hmm. He kind of can't stop. And as you can imagine, it's quite alienating to people he, you know, like his girlfriend. Um, so we witness his final screaming episode in the book. But 
it was fun, even though I find, you know, the artificiality of mediated, mediated experience really irritating. Like I, I don't watch much TV. And sometimes when I'm watching it, I just think I cannot believe how phony this is. Yeah. But it was a lot of fun to take my own judgmental perspective, push mm -hmm. it to a cartoonish degree in Alfred mm -hmm. and basically turn it into comedy. Mm -hmm. It was a great scene. But speaking of those philosophy classes where one sat around talking about authenticity, we can get to existentialism now. One of my favorite <laughs> quotes in the book is actually about existentialist, an existentialist threat. Bix's, one of Bix's son says that own your unconscious is an existential threat to fiction. All right, so as a fiction writer, I'm going to ask you, so how so? That's my first question. Well, I mean, this is these are Gregory's words. Gregory's um, words, right. So the thing that is so um, exciting to the general public in this book about um, the collective consciousness, which is the shared collective swirl of memories of millions of people that are searchable to those who have contributed to it, what makes people want to do this which was not something Bix predicted. This is a surprise to him. He did not think this would be such an important part of his invention. What they love about it is the authenticity of it. So in my world of this book, social media is over because now everyone realizes, well, that was kind of fake because people were like, you know, they were showing their, uh, their amazing vacation, but we didn't see the screaming fight everyone had. Mm -hmm. If you're inside people's memories, you see all of it. It's, it's unvarnished, it's uncurated and completely un, uh, un, in, undigested. Um, so, so that is a threat to fiction because Fiction is the one narrative art form that actually places us inside the minds of other mm -hmm. human beings. If you're looking at an image, you are actually on the outside. The opposite is happening. Mm -hmm. So that's what Gregory means. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, again, this is very tug in cheek because of course there is no real machine like that. Mm -hmm. The only machine operating here is my book. <laughs> so, um, but that's what he means. Yeah. But it made one think about uh, what fiction means uh, and how it could relate in a world that is like the world you created. And it made me wonder if fiction is our true collective consciousness. That's it. I mean, I think you could, it's not just fiction. You know, I, I think, I mean, if you think about it, what are we left with, you know, 300 years later, we're left with art. Mm -hmm. That's what survives. Yes. No one remembers who was rich you know, who was powerful. That's not what we have to, to learn and to, to try to imagine what other periods of history were like. So we're left with art. Mm -hmm. And in a way that is the most tangible collective consciousness mm -hmm. that we're left with. Mm -hmm. And I think of art as basically artifacts of the, the, the collective dream life of the culture that produces it. Mm -hmm. I really do, you know, and I say this also as a researcher, I, I use especially fiction um, to learn about other eras. It's, it's the most compressed form of information I've encountered because there's the story the writer is attempting to tell. And then there's all the inadvertent storytelling that's mm -hmm. going on, mm -hmm. all the information we're being given because it was assumed that it went without saying. The, the mores around female sexual behavior, which have changed you know, radically and constantly through history, um, the, the things people are remembering, what they're nostalgic about, all of these things that are very hard to glean from just reading history, because the facts might not tell us this. What, what, what I'm looking for is what is what people were thinking about. And fiction is a great way of finding that out. Mm -hmm. You have a great quote at the end of your book in the, in the very last, very touching last chapter. Knowing everything is too much like knowing nothing without a story. It's all just information. Um, how do you know when it's too much information when you're writing? Well, what I was thinking about there, I mean, I, you know, in a way I'm not dealing with much information because mm -hmm. I'm just dealing with instinct and I'm trying mm -hmm. to find a story. What I, one of the kind of abstract thoughts that, that I was really interested in as I worked on this book was the relationship between 
data and storytelling mm -hmm. or, you know, data and narrative, which are posed in our culture, our, our collective thinking sort of as opposites. Yeah. And I, I had a, 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 an important revelation when I was arguing with my older son about why he wasn't reading, um, which we did a lot. And there was some moment where I said, OK, now it's time to put that book of statistics away and then and do a little reading before you go to bed. He was like, I don't know, eight or nine. And he said, I am reading. And I said, no, no, I know. But I not numbers like actual words. And he said, I, 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 know, I said, I want you to read a story. And he said, this is a story. And I said, what do you mean? Now I was interested. And so he it was a box of statistics that described the entire career of a particular baseball player. And he narrated the story of that career and it was riveting. And I, I thought, oh my God, numbers tell stories. Math is narrative. An equation is, is, a, is a narrative. Mm -hmm. And it was incredible. And then I thought, okay, because the, my next thought is always, how can I use it in fiction? And I thought, <laughs> okay, I'm going to have a chapter in my book that's only numbers. Well, that was maybe a little too hard. <laughs> I, I never got past trigonometry. Um, but it got me thinking about the relationship between statistics and narrative. And one of the things that that has always struck me about we're we're as a culture in love with data. We just mm -hmm. can't get enough of it. But its predictive powers are so limited. You know, 9-11, we had all the information, the data mm -hmm. was there, but it didn't get to the right people. It wasn't put together in the right ways. And the disaster was not prevented. Mm -hmm. um, Trump's election, he didn't even think he would be elected. Again, the polls were wrong. The data was there, but it wasn't, the storytelling didn't happen. Pandemic, out of nowhere. So I find myself thinking, what was missing there? What was missing was the storytelling. Mm -hmm. That's what activates data and actually mm -hmm. turns it into something that is usable. Mm -hmm. So the, in fact, the two need each other. They're mm -hmm. not opposites. Yep. You can't have a story without the raw elements and you can't have raw elements that you don't turn into a story because there's nothing there uh, that's that that people can hold on to. The story gives it its shape. Exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah, I've done as a journalist, I've had to take yearly um, statistics about circulation in public libraries and turn it into stories. And that's the fun part. It's really fun to see how the story comes from that raw data and think of the different directions you could take. Exactly. And if you just gave us all the data and said, well, whew, you're not going to believe this. Look at this. <laughs> We'd be like, uh, wh what is this? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that it's of I've come to feel it's actually a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, that's one of those things that I only learned from writing this book. So that was a fun discovery. Yeah. Again, an act of discovery. But I have one last question, uh, real quickly before we get to Jennifer's going to read to us. Um, but I loved it when the two ancient alphas, this is actor Jazz Attenborough and singer Bosco Baines, roar up to the dock in their speedboat with some clever manipulating from Lulu has ulterior motives. But it's sort of, I was, I had two, I had a lot of different thoughts about them. Like as another ancient, if not an alpha, I took heart in their resilience. But I also started thinking about their celebrity as, you know, maybe, and possibly symptomatic of how image obsessed we can be. And I was wondering really what you thought of them and why they came into the story, because they did come in with a bang. So these are two people that we know from Goon Squad, Benny Salazar, who's a major character. Well, first of all, I I did I wanted to see them again if I could find a way to do it, but it's just wanting that is does not mean I can make it happen because it's very artificial to be, you know, jamming characters who don't who aren't essential to a story into that story. But this one chapter, which is an epistolary chapter, so it's all electronic communication. It, it it allowed me to kind of build to a crescendo where these communications have started to involve lots and lots of people. Um, and I felt a kind of fondness for these guys. You know, well, I guess one of the things that I struggled with is, okay, they're now actually in their 70s. And I'm thinking like, how do I bring them into the action here? Like this, mm -hmm. this they don't, they're to some degree, their careers are on the wane, these two. Mm -hmm. But 
of course, as someone who just turned 60, I don't like the thought of that. Um, so it was kind of my pleasure to find a way. I mean, basically, Benny Salazar has a has a strategy to revive the career of the lead singer of the Conduits, which is a band that um, Benny discovered long ago. And so he basically does that. He creates a media event involving Bosco and he he makes it happen. And in fact, the, the phrase, the candy house comes up, it only comes up twice in the book, but it comes up there where Benny says, okay, yeah, we're trying to get some you know attention here, but what we're really trying to do is you know, create a candy house that will lure in a younger generation, get them interested in this music and bewitch them. And you could argue that, you know, at, this book is my at, the attempt to do exactly the same. I like that. That authentic moment, right? <laughs> no, but very much appreciated, uh, as I said, that, that they had the chance and I think that you brought them in seamlessly. In fact, I think it worked very well. So now... My questions are over, but we are going to have a reading. A very short one. Um, I'm just going to read a little bit of the beginning of a chapter called The Mystery of Our Mother. Long ago, she told us when we were just a hope in her heart, or not even that because she never wanted children or thought she didn't, a higher power touched our mother's head and said, stop what you're doing. Two little girls are waiting to be born and you need to have them right away because the world is desperate for their brightness. So she stopped studying anthropology, which she really did love and maybe would study again someday when you're all grown up and don't need me anymore. We'll always need you. I'll always need you too, that's for sure. I'll try not to drive you crazy with my mommy needs. Till the end. Well, I stopped going to anthropology school and I married your daddy and we brought you into the world. And here you are. It all worked out perfectly. Where is daddy? You'll see him next week. He's taking you to ballet. Last time he never came. I'll be here just in case. He can't make a bun. That's not important, honey. Before ballet? Don't whine, sweetie. He threw Tam Tam out the window of the car. He said she was moth eaten. That was unfortunate. How could you marry him? Love is a mystery. Does daddy love you? He loves you. That's what matters. He said we were young spendthrifts. Did he now? He said, can we not talk about what he said? We're just telling you. I don't need to be told. I know your father very well. How did she endure these conversations? Of course, our father didn't love her any more than she loved him. He was 15 years older than our mother, twice divorced when they met with four kids, two by each ex-wife. How's that for a rotten prospective husband? But he was charming, a famous record producer, and above all, we later surmised, he wouldn't take no for an answer. Why he wanted our mother to say yes is another mystery. They had nothing in common beyond a taste for beauty, his, and beauty, hers. But she never lived by her beauty. She was the kind of mom who rarely wore makeup, who let her hair grow wild, and didn't bother sh to shower on Sunday, her day off from the travel agency where she went to work after our father stranded her without any money to raise us. On the occasions when our father showed up to take us to ballet, we walked grimly down the cracked outdoor steps from our second story apartment to one of his many cars. Hello, girls. One of you want to ride in front? We shook our heads. It wasn't safe. Everyone knew that except him. How about something to eat? We've got time before your class. We don't eat before ballet. I can't do anything right with you two, can I? We shook our heads. And he laughed and began to drive. But when he pulled up in front of the strip mall where the ballet studio was, he turned around and peered at us in the back seat. I'm your father. You understand that, don't you? We nodded in stony unison. That's not nothing. That means something. He searched our cold eyes. You don't like me. Why? It was not a rhetorical question. He was curious, awaiting a reply. We looked at our father closely for perhaps the first time. 
his weathered surfer's tan and longish blonde hair, his crooked front teeth. He watched us watch him, and then he laughed. How would you know? You're just two little kids. I'll stop there. Okay. And did I mention you're really wonderful at dialogue? Thank you. Know, that's you. A, a very lovely quality of reading your book. Okay, now it's time for, uh, I've asked my question, it's time for you to ask your questions. Um, I And we, we don't have a lot of time, so please let not two and three part questions uh really be focused also, because I forget the rest of the questions yeah that that I, and i am I, that's a, that's something i do all the time do multiple questions and that is true my 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 subject forgets so don't do that to jennifer give her a pointed question uh and we're really excited to hear what you have to ask so we have um mike's here and and where's anybody oh. ah let's the gentleman over there Hello, uh, Jennifer. The character of Miles and his journey from loneliness to addiction to suicide attempt and redemption, what inspired you to write that? I just found it was so profound. And I see that in, you know, I see that pattern in my own life and in the lives of a lot of my male friends. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, well, Miles sort of appeared to me first as the sort of perfect goody goody guy who makes his brothers feel inadequate so i knew that about him first and so then the question is always sort of what's behind that and i was very curious about miles because he was kind of opaque he seems kind of too good to be true he's that guy who always seems to do everything right so i wrote improv i, I had a sense that he was going to have some sort of big fall but i wasn't sure what it would be and I also knew he was in Chicago and I mentioned time and place being so important. And I actually was born in Chicago and my father lived in Chicago. Um, my father was an alcoholic and struggled with addiction in that way. So there may have been some bi autobiographical reasons, um, but it I sort of, I started writing about Miles knowing that I was gonna write the story of Miles's, you know, blowing up his life and then we'll see what happens. But I will say, so Miles, it, this happens quickly enough. I don't think this is really a spoiler. We learn that Miles has, you know, basically a, a prescription drug addiction, which no one knows about um, because he's very hard on himself and wants to exert himself to a kind of perfection that's not possible. And I think actually one thing we haven't touched on, and this is a good occasion to say it, is that for me, journalism has been a fantastic way to just learn a lot about the world around me that I might not otherwise know. And so I did a piece on opi women with opioid dependency who become pregnant and followed them through their pregnancies and deliveries, uh, mostly in Providence and also Philadelphia. So for about a year, I was spending a lot of time talking to lots and lots of people who had fallen into addiction, usually through prescription drugs. I mean, it was almost insane how exactly the same the story was so many times. So I think that just effortlessly flowed into the story of Miles. Um, so it was a combination of, of different factors um, aroused by the curiosity about who this judgmental guy is to himself. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions? Over there, yeah. Hi, I'm curious about your writing process and whether you write every day, do you wait for inspiration to strike? Kind of what, what that looks like on a daily or weekly basis. Um, if I waited for inspiration to strike, I would probably be a lawyer now. Um, no, I do not wait. Uh, I find that it rarely does. Is, the, is this ringing? Are people troubled by that or am I the only one hearing it? Okay. I'm not sure if I should switch microphones. I'm open to anything. Um, actually, now it sounds a little better. Okay. Anyway, um, so, I, oh, here, okay. Um, I find that, that the inspiration usually comes once I'm working. It's very, very analogous to exercise. So if you are out of practice with exercising, there's always a reason not to. And that is totally the same with writing. So what I try to do is reach a point where 
I'm, I feel so, the, the writing feels so habitual that it's weird not to do it. So when I'm writing original material, I try to write five to seven pages a day and I write fiction by hand should have mentioned that purely because that is the, the best way for me to connect to the sort of improvisational blind, um, you know, more spontaneous kind of writing that, that gets me my best material. So ideally five to seven pages a day, it, sometimes I can work on two first drafts at once. So I worked on some chapters of this while writing the first draft of Manhattan beach. And in that case, it would be more like four to five of each. And usually at different times a day, a little hard to go right from one to the other. Um, so that's the ideal. It's hard. Like right now I'm working on a journalism piece. So I'm spending a lot of time reporting. I'm, I'm not at all doing that five to seven pages a day, truth be told. Um, so I feel a little rusty, but I, I find that the inspiration part only comes if I show up and the showing up has to be habitual. Over here. So you've talked about the daisy chain nature of each of the chapters, and I'd love to hear more about how you decided to order them, because I can imagine it was almost like putting together an album in which each could exist on their own, but there is a deliberate order. The order is actually one of the, um, and by the way, I love the daisy chain metaphor. Oh. That was yours. Um, it That is one of the last things to fall into place. With A Visit from the Goon Squad, I had a misconception about the order. I thought it would go, I thought the chronology would go backwards. And that seemed really cool. I knew I hadn't, I mean, other people have done it, but it's not that common. And I had a rude shock when I read the chapters in that order, which was that it the book was really flat. And I thought, oh no, why, why is it losing energy as I go? It's supposed to be doing the opposite. And I realized that chronology was undermining a lot of surprises and little rewards for the reader that came about through juxtapositions that were all about sort of curiosity and satisfaction of curiosity. So, you know, for example, in that book, we learned that uh, Benny Salazar, um, who is a music producer, was a punk rocker as a teenager. In my chron backwards chronology, we had to wait eight chapters, and then we suddenly are seeing Benny as a punk rocker teenager, at which point we've forgotten that moment when we learned that. <laughs> so it, there was no payoff. There was just confusion. So I knew that with this book, that would be a, a late um, decision. And really the, the way that I try to do it is, it, it's a combination of having a big structural idea in mind, but much more on a granular level. If we've just read this, what is the most fun thing that we could encounter next? Very subjective. Um, that's basically how I did it. Fun results too, okay. Other people, other right here, and there's and your mic is coming. I just have a quick question because you say you kind of write things out of order. Do you ever fall in love with a section, but you know it doesn't work, and how do you force yourself to edit it out? Ah, oh, such a good question. I mean, if I'm if I'm really in love with it, it probably does work. Um, so there are two different forms of this that can happen. One is I've worked unbelievably hard on something and therefore I'm partial to it, mostly because it represents a huge investment of time, even though in my deepest depths, I know it's not working. So that's that's one thing that can happen. And usually cutting, when something doesn't belong in a work, I find that cutting it always brings a feeling of relief. What's maybe the hardest though, is recognizing that a scene that really does work and that I really like is actually inessential. It just, it's not doing anything for us that isn't getting done elsewhere. And so I could leave it in, you know, you can get away with some extra in a novel, but it, I just feel like it's never a good idea because I talked about compression being the basic 
job of fiction, in my opinion. And so with every little bit of fluff that's kind of there because it's fun, even though it's inessential, I'm losing some of that compression. And I think losing the overall power on some level. So there was a scene in Manhattan Beach that I really liked. Um, and I it was pretty powerful in its way, but it just, we didn't need it. So I cut it and it felt good to cut it. I did actually um, include it on the website for that for Manhattan Beach, which lets you go underwater and find all these artifacts and it's still there. Um, and so that, that scene is one of those sort of little treasures, if you will, that the reader can find if they're looking around. But it, that's really all it deserved because it just didn't need to be there. And I, I, I try to be pretty strict with myself about that, even when it kind of hurts. Yeah, can I just interrupt to ask, do you ever take are those excise sections uh, and put it in a whole other book a whole other time? Uh, has that ever happened for you? Not exactly. I mean, I find that, you know, as I said, there's such a high, I hate the word failure, even though I feel it all the time, but um, there's a lot of material that ends up not working mm -hmm. in these books. And sometimes, and I, and often it's, it's that I couldn't find the right way to do what I'm trying to do. So actually what I just read to you is a good example of this. I really wanted to use the first person plural in this book to narrate an entire chapter in the form of we. So not everything can be done that way. I mean, in fact, most things can't be done that way. And what I find is when I have a strong structural idea like that, my job is to find a story that cannot be told any other way. If I if I if I'm just wedging it onto something that could be told differently, it never works. Mm -hmm. So I had a few ideas about what groupings of people could narrate a chapter in the form of we, and I would start writing about them. But what I find when something doesn't isn't quite right is that instead of feeling freed, I feel very constrained by whatever choice it is that I've made. So in this case, it, it, the question would, would arise strongly, like, why are these people talking as one? I don't, I don't like it. They're three different people. I want to write about each of them. So, so that didn't work. And then I tried something else. I tried another approach to the first person plural. I tried in, in, telling another story using it. That didn't work. So that was a lot of pages of material not working. However, I then landed, I, I sort of heard a voice that felt promising in these two girls, these sisters who narrate this chapter. And so finally, when I started writing in that way, it really flowed. I mean, the dialogue I was reading to you was quite spontaneous and not many drafts between start and finish with some, with some of this stuff that happened very spontaneously. So finally, I had found a way to do the thing I was trying to do. But along the way, there was a lot of there were a lot of outtakes, mm -hmm. but no way are you going to be reading those because they aren't good. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they are out. Exactly. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, other questions over here? Yeah. Oh, All right there and then there. Uh, when you set out or when you write a short story, do you set out to write a short story or do you set out to write a story, a novel, and then it's uh, some revelation takes place and changes things? I, I feel like I can usually sense the, sh the um, length. You know, with with I mean, with a book like this, I knew I was writing in shorter pieces, so there wasn't really a mystery about it. Um, and and with each of these technical approaches, one reason it's sort of fun to bring things like first person plural to a book like this is I can't really imagine trying to make that work for a whole book. Not I mean, maybe it would be feasible, but the question is always why and particularly what am I gaining and what am I losing? With every approach, you know, there's a kind of cost cost benefit analysis, and so the question is always, you know, can I sustain the benefits over the course of a whole book, um, and not have it be plagued by the deficits? So, um, so I with with strong approaches like this, and there's another chapter in this book written for Twitter at 140 characters. Um, 
there, uh, those, those are best suited to a shorter form. But when I have a bigger idea, I guess it really does feel kind of big. And usually, again, because it's time and place that I start with, you might think I could just think, well, how long do I want to be here? Is this short or long? But somehow the time or place actually seems to suggest the length right from the get-go. So I so far have usually been able to tell. The, there was one exception, which is the one that I wrote, the chapter I wrote for, <clears throat> for Twitter, excuse me. <laughs> um, that was about double the length it ended up being. And, and so that was a little hard to know, but I never thought it would be a whole novel. I thought it might be a novella. Which it, which it maybe technically was when it was originally published in the New Yorker, and then I shortened it more. But yeah, the 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 length is somehow suggested. Time for one more question, right? And I'm happy to keep this conversation going for those of you who didn't get um, called on. Hello, I'm out there. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not staging a rebellion. I refuse to leave. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much for being here. It's been uh, amazing to hear you talk. But um, my question is, you mentioned that you had started writing some of the stories for the Candy House kind of when you were doing even a visit from the Goon Squad tour. So my question is, how did you decide that you weren't finished with these characters in this universe and that you wanted to continue on with them? I think that there were a few different reasons. I mean, one is just that, you know, with a, with a book in which each person, each chapter has a different protagonist, there is a potential infinity of possibilities because each of us is the center of our own world. So it there was an inherently open-ended quality to it, but I think what, and, and, I, and by the way, it did feel finished. In other words, I didn't have the thought as I was working on the, uh, I've, it was actually the Twitter chapter that I was writing on my book tour. I didn't think, oh, damn, I wish I'd started this earlier because I could have included it. It definitely felt like a, uh, that book was was what it was. And now I was sort of going on. But I think what really made it feel what drew, most drew me back were things that felt not exactly unfinished, but not fully explored. Sometimes it was chapters that hadn't worked but that had included characters that I then didn't end up writing about. So for example, Miles, Ames, and Alfred, who are brothers, and we've talked about them in various ways, uh, are mentioned by name in A Visit from the Goon Squad, but that's it. We never even meet them. In one of my failed chapters, we had met all of them. So I sort of knew them and knew about their history. And I knew that Miles was kind of a pill, um, but the reader never really sees that. So that that is always troubling to me because generally the reader knows everything I know. I don't really hold back. So that created a sense of, of possibility. And then other characters felt a little opaque, like Lou Klein, the father in the chapter that I just read a little bit of, um, is the only major, the only character who I would call a major character in both books. And he's a lot of people's least favorite character in Goon Squad. He's a guy who's caused a lot of destruction. Um, but I guess I felt like I have a certain affection for him, I will admit. Um, and I felt like I wanted to see, we see him causing a lot of trouble in Goon Squad. And I wanted to sort of see him be tamed in a way. And I kind of knew it was these little girls who were going to do it. And I wanted to watch that unfold. So sometimes it's a sense that I've only shown one side of someone and I want to see the rest of them. Uh, so it was, it was things like that, that really drew me back um, and made me feel that it wasn't that the book wasn't complete, but that there were, I myself was just so curious about some of these people that I just had to find out more for myself. Okay. All right. And I think that's it. So a huge round of applause for them. Thank you all. Thank you.